Infante. Millions around the world are marking International Quds Day. Palestinians and those in solidarity with the cause are calling for the freedom and the return of the free nation of Palestine and are replacing street rallies with online events and they're also celebrating within their vehicle amid the coronavirus pandemic. Al-Quds being the Arabic name for Jerusalem, the event usually takes place on the last Friday of the month of Ramadan and was introduced by Iran's founder Ayatollah Khamenei following the Iranian revolution in 1979. In an address marking the event, Iran's supreme leader called Israel a cancerous tumor that will undoubtedly be unrooted and destroyed, uprooted and destroyed. This as he likened the Zionist regime to COVID-19. The U.S. and Western countries equipped this fake and occupying regime with various kinds of military and non-military tools of power, even with atomic weapons. Some regional countries justify their ugly behavior and argue that the Zionist regime is a reality in the region, without realizing that deadly and detrimental realities must be fought with and destroyed. Today the coronavirus is a reality, and the whole intelligent people consider fighting it a must. The long-lasting Zionism virus will definitely not survive for long from now on. Jordan's Prime Minister Omar Razaz said that the Arab nation will not exist any unilateral Israeli moves to annex the Jordan Valley and Palestinian territories. Razaz said that the world would be a witness to an apartheid state if Israel moved forward with its plans. The words of His Majesty the King were very clear. We will not accept the annexation of Palestinian lands. And based on that, we would reconsider our relationship with Israel in all its dimensions. We don't want to rush, we don't want to anticipate things, but continuously His Majesty holds the countries of the world responsible for this matter. God forbid that the world witnesses an apartheid state. The children of slain Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi have pardoned his murderers. Khashoggi's eldest son Salah tweeted about the decision on the last night of Ramadan. According to Saudi law, a pardon from a son of a murder victim serves as a legal reprieve. The move spares five, day, spares five government forces the death penalty two years after their conviction. Eleven people in total were charged for the murder, which occurred at a Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, in October 2018. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia has denied ordering the killing. A passenger plane belonging to state-run Pakistani International Airlines has crashed near the southern port city of Karchi. The aircraft, arriving from the eastern city of Lahore, was carrying 99 passengers and eight crew members, according to the spokesman of the country's Civil Aviation Authority. The accident left at least eight dead and 15 injured. The residential area on the edge of the airport, known as Model Colony, is a poor community and is heavily, heavily congested. Haiti has recorded three more deaths due to COVID-19, along with 71 new cases. This takes the number of confirmed positives to 734. According to the Ministry of Health, there are 688 active cases, 21 people have recovered, and 25 people have died in total. The authority is once again pleading with citizens to abide by social distancing and maintain hygienic practices to stem the spread of the virus. As St. Kitts and Nevis prepares for general elections on June the 5th, the chief medical officer is warning the public to remain cognizant of the novel coronavirus. I sense that we are beginning to lapse into a state of complacency with regards to this pandemic. And as we move into the general elections, it's important for us to realize that this pandemic has not gone away and it's not going away anytime soon. In the Bahamas, prospective family members have attended a remembrance service in Abaco to bury 55 unidentified people who died during the Hurricane Dorian on the island. The ceremony is being held amid the coronavirus pandemic as the Atlantic hurricane season is nine days away. The powerful Category 5 storm made landfall over Abaco on November 1st, wreaking havoc, flattening homes, causing ceiling height floods, and destroying property. 
Across the Bahamas and its Ks, 74 people were killed, while 284 remain missing. St. Lucia is mourning the death of cultural giant Joyce Augusta, who, whose body was discovered at her home on Thursday. The 76-year-old is a pioneer of St. Lucian folk music, founding the Joanara Voices that was instrumental in the resurgence of indigenous sounds. She is a published author, educator, netball champion, and was awarded Sports Woman of the Year in 1969. In 2000, Augusta was named the OECS List of Outstanding Women of the 20th Century. Meanwhile, she was bestowed the single honor of having her photograph on the country's 10 cent stamp in 1978. We'll take a short break now. Short break now, don't go away. Welcome back. According to the Venezuelan government, Colombia is serving as a center of operations for mercenaries and for the development of terrorist plots against the Bolivarian Revolution. Venezuela has detained more than 60 mercenaries who were involved in an attempted incursion in the country. We met with Captain Antonio Sequea in the city of Bogota, and he proposed a military operation that was being organized by the U.S. government, led by President Donald Trump. Testimony provided by the mercenaries point to having been trained by paramilitary groups in Colombia's Rio Atcha and Guajira regions. To meet Venezuelans in Colombia, train them, and come with them to Venezuela to secure Caracas and uh, secure an airport here. Since September 2019, Venezuela has publicly denounced the existence of these paramilitary camps, revealing their locations and exposing the link between those behind the plots and Colombian drug traffickers. Armed groups are being trained in northern Colombia, joining forces with drug traffickers, the same illicit business the Colombian government allegedly battles. The same traffickers that the DEA is pursuing under the many operations announced by President Donald Trump. Well, it seems their plans have not only failed to hurt drug traffickers, but have actually strengthened powerful criminal gangs that control northern Colombia. It took eight months for the Colombian government to respond, although they only addressed those who leaked the information. We're doubling down on mechanisms within the public institutions to identify any wrongdoing by public servants who may be working for dictatorial regimes in the region. For Caracas, this confirms Colombia's involvement in Operation Gideon. Their plan commenced when they called on Venezuelan soldiers to desert the military over a year ago. What you are doing will undoubtedly generate a domino effect in your country. What you are doing is very brave. That same day, opposition figure Juan Guaido congratulated the deserters that would supposedly fill the ranks of an armed invasion into Venezuela. Congratulations for standing by the Constitution. This former Venezuelan soldier had publicly deserted the military hours before driving an armored truck through a border crossing, running over at least two people. He is one of the mercenaries captured during the foiling of Operation Gideon. Canada does not deserve a seat on the UN Security Council. That's what a new petition by the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute says that Canada, despite its peaceful reputation, is, quote, not acting as a benevolent player on the international stage. Among those who've already signed are Palestinian Solidarity and Middle East peace groups, as well as a number of organizations which are fighting against the displacement and crimes which are committed under transnational extractivist operations which are headquartered in Canada, but seen all over the world. The petition will be delivered to UN member states prior to the vote for the Security Council seat in June. Well, I don't think there's any real division on that. I think all Canadians want uh, Canada to have a strong and reasonable voice on the international scene, and that's what we're always seeking to have. The Security Council of the United Nations is one means of ensuring that our values are shared and 
that we can push for more cooperation between countries and more multilateralism. And we can do that with a seat at the UN Security Council. But it is one way of uh, uh, pursuing our engagement uh, with the rest of the world and not an end in itself. For more, we're joined by Eves Engler. He's the author of 11 books, including his latest, House of Mayors, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy, and he's also an organizer of The Open Letter. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Let's start at home. The Trudeau, Trudeau government has violated the rights of Indigenous people earlier this year, pushing through pipelines. How has the government failed to live up to obligations on Indigenous rights and sovereignty? Well, they uh, sent in militarized police to try to force through a pipeline through Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, despite the resistance of the of uh, indi indigenous leadership. Uh, they have spoken of a good game of reconciliation, but when there are uh, extractivist companies that uh, that uh, want uh, to use indigenous territory, um, the Trudeau government has uh, has sided with the companies and not with. Uh, with the inalienable rights that have been of Indigenous people that have been uh, uh, trampled on, and a number of different UN organizations have criticized the Canadian government's repeated violation of Indigenous rights. Okay, so going back to this uh, bid to get a seat on the UN Security Council, what has the government of Justin Trudeau said is the reason? Well, they say that Canada is, you know, supporting the international rules-based order. Um, but what this letter is saying that, in fact, the Canadian government is violating the international rules-based order. It is, it is, uh, you know, intervening in Venezuelan affairs contrary to uh, the the UN Charter, the OAS Charter. It is, uh, it is, uh, is refused to sign all kinds of uh, international treaties, international labor organization treaties, the Basel Ban Amendment. It's, uh, it signed on to the Paris Climate Accord, but it's completely violated. The uh, the emissions uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions that it that it committed to, um, and it's continued this uh, you know aggressive support for uh, Canadian mining companies around the world, Canadian companies that are involved in all kinds of abuses. A uh, uh, half dozen UN reports have criticized the Canadian government for refusing to uh, bring in regulations on Canadian mining companies that they support internationally, even when they're involved in huge abuses abroad. Um, the letter is, uh, is basically saying that the uh, member states of the UN Security Council shouldn't uh, reward uh, the bad behavior of, uh, of Canadian foreign policy. Okay, so one of the things the petition mentions is that Canada has a role in NATO and in arms exporting. So tell us how those weapons, according to this petition, has fueled conflicts globally. Well, Canada, despite the uh, reputation as a, as a peaceful international player, has a major arms industry that exports primarily to the U.S., uh, and obviously the U.S. military is involved in conflicts all around the world, but also the Canada's uh, second biggest recipient of Canadian arms in recent years has been the, uh, the monarchy in Saudi Arabia, which of course is involved in a, a devastating war in Yemen. And Canada has uh, has delivered billions of dollars of weaponry to the Saudis in recent years. Uh, Canadian uh, sniper rifles have been shown to be used in Yemen. Uh, Canadian light armored vehicles have been involved in the conflict in Yemen. And the Trudeau government uh, signed off on a $14 billion, $14 billion, the largest export uh, agreement in Canadian history uh, of light armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia, despite the conflict. And in fact, in their justification for selling these weapons to Saudi Arabia, uh, they cite the fact that Saudi Arabia most damagingly in recent years in Yemen. So now we have to discuss the way in which Ottawa has mimicked every move of Washington. Yeah, I mean, they backed, we mentioned in a letter, they backed the coup against uh, Morales, uh, you know, supported the Organization of American States initiative to you know, fraudulently declare the elections uh, illegitimate in, in, in Bolivia. But it's really foreign ministers had a had a call with uh, Juan Guaido, reaffirmed Canada's diplomatic support with Juan Guaido, uh, had calls with uh, Colombian and Brazilian officials uh, where they talked about Venezuela, and and basically the Canadian government has 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 you know from implementing four rounds of sanctions against Venezuela in recent years to bringing Venezuela to the International Criminal Court uh, to being the instigator of the U.S. Special Forces uh, Zudro that 
behind the recent uh, um, mercenary uh, effort in, 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 uh, in Venezuela, he actually was in the Canadian military beforehand. The Canadian military, when asked about his background with the Canadian military, has refused to divulge any information. The Canadian government has refused to uh, criticize uh, this botched invasion where there was a Canadian involved in. Um, and this is just part of a uh, all-out effort to, to overthrow the government in, in Venezuela. And it's all being done under the guise that there's a you know constitutional problems or there's you know human rights violations. But we we back uh, the uh, Duque government in Colombia that's far worse human rights record. We back the uh, uh, um, uh, 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 government in Honduras who, who has basically no constitutional legitimacy. We back the Canadian government backs the uh, Jovenel Moïse government in Haiti that has uh, no support within the country. Totally dubious. Uh, a government completely relying on Washington and, and Ottawa's backing. Um, so, you know, the effort about ousting the Maduro government has nothing to do with human rights, nothing to do with democracy. It has to do with a government that has not followed the orders uh, of, of Washington and Canada has completely aligned with this campaign to overthrow the Venezuelan government. And today, of course, is Cuds Day, and Palestinian rights and solidarity groups are among those who signed this letter. In what ways does Canada provide assistance to illegal to the illegal Israeli settlement enterprise, and how does this pertain um, to this letter and their seat on the the potential seat on the council? Well, first of all, back in November of 2018, Canada's foreign affairs minister, when in Israel, said that if Canada won a seat on the Security Council. That, it, that Canada would act as a, quote, asset for Israel. She said that explicitly. Um, and the Canadian government, had, you know, there's so many ways that Canada has supported uh, Zionism and the dispossession of Palestinians historically. Some of the most egregious examples are uh, the fact that the Canadian government votes against, uh, have voted against, the current government has voted against uh, dozens, more than 50 resolutions at the UN uh, uh, upholding Palestinian rights. And, and the Canadian government is, is isolated uh, with the U.S., Israel, sometimes Micronesia, Paolo, maybe one or two other countries on resolutions that are supported by basically every country in the world. Um, uh, so that's a, you know, a, a clear reason itself that being offside with international opinion at the U.N., that in and of itself is a reason enough to vote against Canada's bid for Security Council seat. And we actually compiled, since 2000, Canada has voted against 166 resolutions uh, uh, defending Palestinian rights at the UN. Um, and the two countries Canada is going against for these uh, seats on the UN Security Council, Norway and Ireland, have not voted against one single of these resolutions. So that in and of itself should, should be enough of a reason to vote against Canada's bid. But more generally, Canada has a free trade agreement that accepts goods produced in illegal settlements to enter Canada. Uh, tariff-free, which is a way of legitimating uh, the Israeli settlement project in the West Bank. Uh, the Canadian government has, has, has defended the importation of products, wines, from illegal settlements in the West Bank into Canada and labeled them as products of Israel, again, and legitimating the Israeli occupation. There's a long list of examples of Canada's contribution to Palestinian dispossession. Thank you so much. We've been speaking to author Yves Engler. He's in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, an organizer with the Open Letter, which argues that Canada is undeserving of a seat on the UN Security Council. You've been a great person to speak to on Canadian foreign policy. Hope to have you again. Thanks a lot, Pat. Now on to some other news. Several uh, international organizations are nominating Cuban medical brigades for the Nobel Peace Prize for their work in fighting COVID-19 around the world. 26 brigades of Cuban doctors are currently working in over 20 countries and have helped almost 30,000 patients fight COVID-19. The Henry Reeve brigades were created by the leader of the Cuban revolution, Fidel Castro, in 2005 and have provided more than 1,200 health specialists to treat the virus. We are grateful to be considered heroes by so many in the world. But we are nothing but doctors, but we've had to play a large role combating this pandemic. 
Puerto Rico is set to reopen certain businesses next week after a two-month lockdown. Beaches, restaurants, churches, hair salons, and retail stores will reopen under curfew next Tuesday, operating under a reduced capacity and strict hygiene measures. All people will be required to wear a mask when outside or inside of a business, regardless of what they're doing. The reopening of lounges and dining rooms in restaurants is authorized as long as operations remain below 25% of the maximum occupancy for the building. According to building codes, and delivery services can be extended until midnight. We stayed open and working so that the public would see us, but the impact has been hard. We have been able to continue paying the employees, but the customer flow has been very poor. We recently had a slight increase in sales, but the impact has been significant. The unemployment crisis in the United States continues to worsen during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the Department of Labor, nearly 39 million people have lost their jobs despite the easing of restrictions. A projection by the Federal Reserve points out that the unemployment rate could hit 25 percent. However, the country also faces the coronavirus crisis, which has continued to intensify over the past two months, with over 1.5 million cases and almost 95,000 deaths reported. Our correspondent Jorge Hestoso is in Washington with the details. Thank you. Almost half of the states, 23 states in the U.S., have shown increase in the cases of coronavirus in this week. That shows that most definitely the pandemic is far from being under control. And also there is no under control the levels of unemployment. There are new figures from the Labor Department that shows that in the last week, 2.4 new requests of uh, benefits has been filed that shows that up to almost 39 million Americans are out of job, 38.6 to be more precise, and those are official numbers. They're estimated that between 8 and 12 million unemployed also are not necessarily reflected on those figures. That means that we're talking about 50 million Americans unemployed. And according to different experts, over 40% of those claims are going to end up being a permanent and definite loss of jobs. So the situation is the worst since the Great Depression of 1930. We are back to you now. And in Honduras, drivers protested to demand economic assistance from the government due to the mandatory lockdown. Main streets have been blocked by thousands of drivers and leaders of the transport sector in various regions of the country. The protest disrupted citizens' mobilization in the Honduran capital as the country reports over 3,000 cases of COVID-19 and 151 deaths. We've reached the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at teleterenglish.net. And of course, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. For Talisar English, I'm Camila Escalante. Thank you for watching.